region's nationalised coal fields, a string of power stations were built. Stourbridge, Walsall, Donington, Staythorpe, by Marnham, Draclow. Didn't I do well? <laughs> the crowning glory of the alliance between coal and electricity was at Rugeley. Above ground was a new power station, and below, a new pit, Lee Hall Colliery. I was working at Rugeley A power station as a rigger. I was on the second coal face at Lee Hall. I used to just love it. The more coal we could send out, the better. I just enjoyed the power station, I used to be proud of it. It was a brilliant idea to have the pit next to the power station supplying with coal. It, it was a ready-made ready market for them, wasn't it? You know, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't go wrong. If you got peckish in the night, you used to go over to their canteen and get a bacon and sarn, which was better than we got across at our place. Mm. It seemed like a match made in heaven. I went on a great trip to Rugeley as a schoolboy. It was one of the most exciting things that you can imagine. You walked into these white control rooms and that gave the impression of a kind of computer age world, really. And when you came out and saw the other half, as it were, of the operation, it was almighty chunks of coal you know, coming up from huge conveyor belts into these terrifying furnaces, which then produced the electricity. So it really was a meeting of two worlds. When we met, when we was not at work, if I'd done a good job, I'd tell him, and if he'd done a good job, he'd tell me, like. So, you know, there was such come about, like, you know, we still keep Britain going, like, you know. Coal had turned the Midlands into a power hub for Britain. Many of the pits are gone, and we import most of our coal, but it remains an engine for the nation. Even today, coal powers many of our power stations, and it's dirty, grubby coal made from ancient primeval trees crushed underground for millennia that allows our new technology to work. And along with centres of power, there are centres of demand. In Great Britain at the moment, most of the power flows pretty much from north to south. About half of GB demand is in the bottom quarter geographically. So we tend to have a general flow across the system from the generation in the north to the big demand centres such as London and the southeast. By the 50s, far more power needed to be shifted across the country than had ever been envisaged by the original grid. The solution? The supergrid. Each line able to carry at least six times more power. In England today, there are already 5,300 route miles of ordinary grid and supergrid like this, which is still being constructed. To carry the extra conductors, Blomfield's pylon doubled in size. Sure-footed as cat burglars, the men clamber about this steel network as though there were a safety net below, while most of us get giddy standing on a chair. To do this job, you need to have a good head for eyes. The normal towers are about 150 foot, but we've got some river crossings of about 650 foot. When you start climbing these 600 foot towers, you do start gripping a lot tighter the further you go up. Even though I suppose if you fall from either, it's going to hurt in the same way. When you first joined the grid, you were just given this belt. It weren't for clipping on, it was to put all your spanners in. If some of the older guys you're with saw you clipping on, you'd probably get a wrap over the knuckles for slowing the job down. It was a, it was a macho thing then. 
about 10, 15 years ago, the Arnises came in. And now you just wouldn't, you wouldn't even dream of climbing unattached. What we've done, we've detected wear on this tower. So our job today is here to replace the fittings. There's a, there's a green flag that denotes that's the side that's safe to work on. And on the actual opposing side, that's still running at 275,000 volts, you'll see that there's red pennants on the arms, and that's to denote that that side is still live. It's like an electrician who might get a bus putting a light fitting in. At these voltages, it will probably blow your arms and legs off. I think when you climb a pylon, you get a, a vision that you don't see on the ground. I can't picture in my head where all the A-roads are, but I can instantly picture in the head where our lines flow. By 1968, power was flowing from the grid into over 90% of British homes. But there were a few places still divided from the main. Now you could see across the lawn, was very bright lights. The local people on this side claimed they could read the papers with the, the reflection of light coming across here which disturbed them quite a bit because they had no power on this side of the law. I don't think anybody gave trees like any thought. They just never gave it any thought. So there was quite a lot of campaigning went about to try and get the power here. Mrs MacDonald suddenly said, why do we not have electricity? And eventually it came in 69, 70. Then started looking at it and laid submarine cables, and that was that. It was really bright. It was just but... before Christmas, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. yes. And there's great excitement. And some people were frightened to switch it on because they didn't even know what was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and they would go back and forth to switch, and a number of times put on and off <laughs> to see that it's, it's still there. <laughs> We were all keen to get the telly. Everybody else had televisions and would be talking about television programmes and you didn't know what they were speaking about. It's good to it's, see the news. Yes, having the electricity did make you feel more connected. To keep up with what was going on in the outside world and you could actually see it as well, rather than just hearing it on the radio. Connected to the grid and to the rest of Britain, in the 1960s, the depopulation of the Highlands finally reversed. Electricity really helped, and with nowadays, with all the modern technology, with computers and that, you don't need to be living in a city, you can do a lot from rural areas. Dotted along the shores of the Loch and across the Highlands are not just crofters, but businesses. I think what is remarkable today is that, for instance, the Highlands got good broadband ahead of much of the rest of Great Britain, and you can work in a, an old Scottish croft about as effectively as you can work here in, in West London in many respects. And so it really doesn't matter where you live anymore. The geography of the Highlands had kept it remote for centuries. Connected to the grid, this very landscape has made the region key to the power map of Britain. Power has come to the glens. It's largely a matter of geography and weather. I, I mean, it may sound uh, jokey to say that everything is wet and uh, you've got to watch out for for rain and, and so on. But uh, that is, in fact, the, uh, the source of the power. And the Highlands also has a solution to the grid's age-old problem of how to store electricity. Pumped storage. If you pump water uphill, you can have power on tap. We might say here, 
we'll throw water at it, which is a, you know, it's a really just a, an, an expression for saying we're going to use our pump storage schemes. And essentially what happens is overnight when electricity is cheap, water is pumped up from the bottom reservoir to the top reservoir and stored there until it's needed. When we get such things as a television pickup, we want lots of electricity at short notice, then water can be run down into the generators and very, very quickly produce quite significant amounts of electricity. If we want to increase 300 megawatts on coal, that might take us half an hour for the station to change its output. If we want to change 300 megawatts, say, on pump storage, we can do that in 10 seconds. In the control centre, our moment-by-moment -moment demand for electricity is matched with what's generated in power stations. Early evening is a tense time. So we've got uh, a number of pump storage units on standby now. They're in what we call spin-gen mode, so they're ready to go. As soon as we send the instruction, they'll be with us within about one or two minutes. The TV pickup approaches as some of the nation's most popular television programmes come to an end. We are like a coiled spring now, ready to go. There's Emma that finishing now, so I may need to pop up with a bit more. Yeah, I think you do. Yeah. OK, I'm going to send foyers, foyers number one, into generation. OK, switch over to BBC One. And it's EastEnders has finished as well. It's finished three minutes early. It's unusual for BBC, but there we go. We're down to 49.9 almost. OK. Foyage number one is in. That's right. The frequency's come up a little bit now. Here it comes. Dinorwick is Good. in. That's another yeah. 150 megawatts. OK, so now we switch over. <laughs> and it should be the start of Coronation Street. Of Coronation Street. Dropping below 49.9. Is that right? Dinorwick number one is coming in, 300 megawatts coming in there now. Demand seems to be levelling off a little. There it goes. And we're heading up to 50 hertz. When you got it first, oh, it was a great thing. You, you handled it with care in case you would break it, but oh no, you just switch it on and that's it. When I flick a switch, I just expect the light to go on. When I see a storm and I see a flicker and I think that's the so and so, they say, hey, it's not your worry. <laughs> I hope it works, because if not, I've got to fix it. If it doesn't go on, <laughs> I normally ring somebody. <laughs> Constructing the grid bound us together as a nation. But once we had the power to plug in, what did we choose to do with it? In the next part, find out how connection to the grid has transformed every part of our lives. From our homes to our workplaces, how we party to the very shape of our cities. Coming up tomorrow here on BBC4, we're remembering a different kind of power with History of the World at half past eight as we go back to the birth of steam. And then at nine, it's the final part of Michael Wood's Story of England. Next tonight, though, we've brand new comedy with Getting On.